Um, thank you, Erica, and uh, good morning. And we're going to spend the next hour together thinking about how to um, leverage, leverage uh, change within complex systems. Um, so um, my, um, my partner's American, so uh, I get confused sometimes. But um, uh, yeah, I'll say leverage. Okay. And um, the, the kind of um, the metaphor, the image that I've chosen is change on a great big wrecking ball because, you know, I think as all of us know, the world that we live in, there's so much change happening and it's getting faster, it's getting more complex. So in a sense, you know, where we need to be as, as clinical leaders is like a great big catching net, you know, that kind of embraces the change and says, yeah, it's coming, bring it on, we're prepared. So what we're going to think about in the next hour are um, strategies and tactics for doing that. And um, here's what we're going to cover. So I want to talk a little bit just about, you know, how the world is changing, how things are becoming more complex. And, you know, I would say the most important factor in terms of being able to make change happen is power. And we, we need to talk about that and we need to, to think about having the power to change things. You know, when it comes to understanding what's going on in complex organisations and complex systems and making change happen, one of the really big themes that's coming through is the role of influencers. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to talk about some of the, um, the big directions in, in large-scale change. And then the final thing we're going to talk about is, you know, when it comes to being able to, um, to, to leverage large-scale change, we need to think about building shared purpose and working interdependently. And working interdependently with other people is different to working independently. We do need to do both, but we particularly, in this complex world, need to work interdependently. So let's get going. Um, it's one of my friends from Twitter, um, uh, at Complex Wales, and it's a, it's a he. And so what I thought we'd do, because we're talking about how to leverage change in complex systems, we should start talking by, by saying, you know, what do we mean by complex systems? So, you know, all of us, what... what you know, um, in, the, in the roles that we do, we're part of a complex system, you know, a complex system of care and support. And Complex Wales says complex systems are driven by the quality of the interactions between the parts of the system and not the quality of the, the parts. So if we work on discrete parts or processes of a system that can properly bugger up the performance at a system level, and the advice is, never fiddle with a part unless it also improves the system, okay? So um, we're going to take that as our mantra, um, uh, you know, uh, for today. You know, doing things differently, never fiddle with a part unless it also improves the system. Um, the, other, the other thing I'm going to say, by the way, is I'm leaving these slides. So if you, you, you know, you can have them all afterwards and you can do what you want with them. Now, um, my team, which is called a Horizons team in the NHS, we support large-scale change in the NHS. And a few years ago, we did a learning review. and We got some external colleagues to come in and help with this. And what they found, the thing they found the most, was just how many of our clinical colleagues at the point of care, nurses, doctors, allied health professionals, and, and so on, felt that they had no power to make change happen. You know, people kept saying time and time again, to our researchers, I don't feel that I can even make small improvements in my system because I haven't got the permission, I haven't got the power um, uh, to do it. And I think, you know, it's a, kind of, it's, a, it's a kind of shocking scenario, really. So actually, if we want to do things differently and we want to we build um, you know, uh, change much more systemically in our system, we, we've got to shift the power. Um, this is a quote that comes from Gary Hamill, and according to the Financial Times, Gary Hamill is the number one influencer in the NHS, in, on the NHS, in the world of, of business. He's a number one kind of thought leader. And what he says, you know, very often, the kind of organisations, certainly, that, you know, um, for me, working in the NHS, you know, we're very big on this. We're very big on conformance, consensus, and cohesion. And those factors are important because... 
you know, if we want every person that we support to have high quality, safe care, of course we need conformance and consensus and cohesion. You know, we need operational excellence to enable every person that we support, every family to get great care. But you know, it isn't enough. Because in this fast moving complex world, we need to value diversity and dissent and divergence, doing things differently as highly as we do you know, operational delivery and operational excellence. That's where the world is going. So in a sense, we need to be, as clinical leaders, the kind of change agents that are not only making sure that every person that we care for and support gets great, you know, consistently great care. You know, we need to be the rebels and the mavericks and, um, and the radicals that are saying, you know, we need to do things in a different way. And in a complex world, we need to do, be doing both roles. So, you know, in order to be able to do this, we need to think about power. And this is Bertrand Russell, the father of modern logic. And what he says is, power is the ability to produce intended effects, you know, the outcomes that we want. So having power means that we can make happen the things that we want to happen. So if it's a day-to-day -day about doing things differently, we really need to think about power. Now, this is a model that I use all the time for thinking about power, which I think is very helpful, okay? We are in a world where there's a, a tension, a, a fight, a battle going on between different kinds of power. And I'm framing them here as old power and new power. So let's have a look at these two different kinds of power. So let's start off with old power. Old power is like currency, it's like money, okay? A few people have got a lot of it, formal authority in organisations, but most of us haven't. And, you know, particularly in big systems like my, this big system I'm part of, it gets pushed down in organisations and systems. And, you know, we get told, you've got to do that because it's the, um, it's the cancer wait time standard. Or you've got to do that because it is the quality protocol. Or you've got to do that because we've got to balance the books at the end of the year. And the thing about old power is it's closed. So again, if I'm the chief exec of a big hospital system, and I go out and, um, and, I, and I work with the um, uh, people in the local hospice, I can't command them to do anything, okay? Like my power ends at the door. And old power is largely about transactions. It's about processes and systems and structures and accountability mechanisms and governance and so on. Okay. Let's contrast that with new power. New power is like a current. It's like a force of electricity. And when a load of people come together with a shared purpose and want the same thing okay, and get organized for it, then that we build power together. So it's made by many people coming together. And in our organizations and systems, we pull new power in. You know, it's open, it's shared. Anybody that wants to be part of our new power movement, you know, can, uh, can join in. And the thing about new power is rather than being based on transactions like old power, you know, i.e. you've got to do this because it's the standard, it's the protocol, it's the policy, whatever. <clears throat> new power is based on relationships. It's based on on trust, it's based on connections. You see, people engage with new power because they want to, because it fits with who they are in the world and the things that matter to them, not because, um, not because they have to. Now, um, my job is I'm the Chief Transformation Officer of the Horizons team, so I get to work with a lot of people who are futurists and scenario planners and forward thinkers, and lots of them are um, prophesizing the, the death of old power. Honestly, in our health and care system in the UK, I can't see old power dying anytime soon. Okay? When, I, when I look at all the NHSs okay, um, you know, across, um, across the UK, old power is, um, is very much alive and kicking. Um, but what we're seeing is this kind of layer of new power coming on the top, okay? creating all kinds of opportunities. So what strikes me is when we talk about, you know, as clinical leaders doing things differently for the future, we have to be able to operate in this very difficult zigzaggy place in the middle. We've got to have the skills um, to work with both. And, I mean, I know quite a lot of old power leaders in the, in the formal system that I'm part of 
who think they can make big radical change happen by old power, by you know, pushing stuff down, top down, and telling people they have to do things. And you know what history tells us you can't. Because if you want to create sustainable change, then you know, it has to come from what's in people's hearts, and it has to fit with that. On the other hand, I know loads of people, like in the um, social enterprise sector, or clinical entrepreneurs, who have got brilliant ideas that could make such a difference for so many people. But they don't know how to navigate the, the formal system, old power, so they get nowhere. So in a sense, we, we've got to be able to work with both systems. OK, let's just stop pause there for a moment. Say hello to the other people on your table if you don't know them. Or if you've all come together, say hello again, OK, from the northwest. Um, and um, what I want you to do, I'm just going to give you about three minutes. What, you know, in terms of old power, new power, what's happening in your world with regard to old power and new power? So have a conversation. And I feel really bad to kind of stopping you talking because there's lots of very energetic conversations going on. But um, hey, I'm in charge. I've got the power. So um, we'll do it my way. So, you know, sometimes, you know, people say to me, oh, Helen, I'm only a nurse or I'm only a trainee or, you know, I'm, um, I'm only a junior doctor. You know, how can I make a difference? I haven't got the power. But the reality is quite different. So this is, um, this is some data that um, influences me quite a lot. And it comes from two Canadian researchers, Batalan and Koschiaro. And what they did was that they went into a very big organisational system and they followed 67 change projects around this big system. And what they wanted to understand was what are the characteristics or the circumstances that enable people to be great change agents? Okay. Does being a great change agent and the power to be a great change agent depend on where you are in the formal system? So that the people at the top of the formal system with more formal authority are the people that have got the power to make change happen? Or, in terms of who's a great change agent and the people to make, with the power to make change happen, is it the people that are actually at the middle of the informal system? Anybody know what the name is of this very large organisational system that these two Canadian researchers went round? Anybody know? The English NHS. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So these two Canadian researchers went round, followed 67 change projects around the English NHS, and what they found was that when it comes to being a great change agent and being able to make change happen, okay, that actually your relationships and connections and how well you are trusted makes a bigger difference than whether you're, uh, you've got formal authority or not. Being at the centre of informal influence was far more important when it came to being able to make change happen than being at the top of the formal system. There's loads of evidence that backs this up. This is Leandro Herrero. He writes about viral change. He's one of my favourite thought leaders. And know what he says? People who are highly connected have got twice as much power to influence change as people with hierarchical power. Okay? And, you know, in a sense, we, we just we have to take it, we have to get organised for it. Let's carry on with this theme. One of the things that or one of the, the new industries that sprung up in the last 10 years is in analysis, and it's organisational network analysis, and ONA. And what ONA means is you can go into an organisational system and do a whole load of analysis around who connects with who and where the influences are and where the relationships are. And this is particularly important when it comes to supporting people to change. Okay. This comes from an organisation called Innovisor, which is a Danish organisation that my team works with. And they have been into hundreds of different organisations and systems. And what they see time and time again is typically there's about 3% of people in an organisation who are what we call the super connectors. And they are influencing and they are driving conversations with 85% of the other people. So if we want to make change happen, we need to find our super connectors. And, you know, again, if you look at the data, what it tells us, you know, why does change go wrong? I mean, change goes wrong for lots of reasons. But um, a major cause of it is because the senior leaders in the organisational system who are really well-intentioned, okay, with their, with their um, change proposals, haven't got ways of having um, a really good dialogue with the informal organisation. And the thing about the informal organisation is 
That's what makes or breaks our ability to make change happen. So we need to find our super connectors, our informal influencers. And what do we know about them? First of all, they're the people in the organisation that other people uh, respect and follow and look to. So they've got the relationships, the networks, the content and the context. And what they do is they drive the perceptions of other people. They're the go-to people for advice. So what it means is that if, like, if, the, if the management okay, produce a new policy or have got some change plans, what people in the organisation will do is go to the super connectors, go to these 3% of people and say, what's going on there? What does this mean? And the super connectors will interpret what's going on for everybody else. So if these super connectors are supporters of the change that you're trying to make happen, then they are incredibly helpful because, you know, they're interpreting what's going on for other people and other people are trusting what they're saying. So they're moving everybody in the direction of the change. However, if you've got super connectors who are opposed to the change that you're trying to make happen, you have got a very big problem, okay? Because again, everybody else is going to them and saying, what's happening? You know, um, you know what does this mean? And, and, and if the super connectors, they, uh, they give people uh, a sense of things, they create meaning for people, which is against the change, it's very, very hard to make the change happen. And, you know, what we know, what the data tells us is that super connectors are trusted by their peers more than formal leaders are trusted. And most formal leaders and organisations don't know who their super connectors are. So let's carry on with that. So, obviously, if these people are so important in change, we're going to try and do things differently, how do you find them? Well, you can bring in like, organisations like Innovisor, and they'll do the analysis for you, and they'll tell you, or you can just ask other people. And all you need to do is just, you know, just go and, go and ask. Like, um, you know, just ask people. So, you know, when you've got concerns at work, who do you go to to ask for information? Or... Um, Whose advice in the organisation do you trust and respect? And what you'll find is people will keep saying the same names over and over again. What I've done there, again, when you get the slides, if, you want, if you're interested in this, um, I've put some different sources there of um, uh, advice or methods for finding your super connectors. So here's a super connector. This is Dave Morgan. He works for North East Ambulance Service. And he's a classic okay, super connector. So... You know, what do people say about Dave? Well, he knows everyone. You know, he knows everyone in the ambulance service, not just in the Northeast. And again, if you want to look for some empirical evidence, go and look for it on social media. You know, he's really influential on Twitter, and loads of ambulance staff use Twitter for work topics. Very interesting, you know, um, when I work with, uh, with, with frontline teams, um, very often the people that are the super connectors are the people that everybody else is following on Facebook. So if you want to kind of get a sense of somebody of super connector, just go and look at, go and look at who's following them on Facebook. And, and also, Dave wants to help you sort out issues. You know, he's respected by frontline people um, and by senior people. So you know, that's a classic um, 3% person. So what's it mean for me as a clinical leader who's trying to make change happen? So first thing is, can you be a super connector? Can you work in ways that will enable you to be a super connector? What do we know? Three things. Firstly, it's based on connections and relationships. You know, we have this Dutch proverb, and it says, trust comes in like a horse and goes out... Um, sorry, it comes in like a... Wrong way around. Let's start again. Trust comes in like a tortoise and goes out like a horse. That's the right way around, yeah. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it takes a long, long time to build up trusting relationships with people. But when our behaviours, um, you know, stop people trusting us, that can happen really quickly. So, so you know, how are we in, you know, working in ways that, that are building, building connections and relationships? And are we being a model of trust? And are we role modelling positive behaviours? Then the other thing, the final thing that's so important about being super connectors ourselves is be the people that follow up. Because, again, you know, people will connect in new power ways, in relational ways, because... They trust that things will happen. And if you start, you know, saying, well, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and it doesn't happen, then people won't trust you anymore. So, so following up is so critical. Okay? And the second thing is not all of us can be super connectors. You know, you might be brand new in a job. So, you know, it can take you a while. So find who your super connectors are. And, um, 
get their insights on the world because everybody else talks to them. They're like a barometer, you know, they're, or, or um, um, I'm, I'm going to mix some metaphors here, but, you know, like they know the pulse of the organisation because everybody talks to them. So they're really, really, um, they've got, a, you know, typically a great perspective. And even if they're anti or negative, they've still got a very uh, important and powerful perspective. Okay. Engage them in the change, you know, give them a special role, um, uh, you know, bring their views into account with the, with the change. And it's all about relationships, you know, with your super connectors. It isn't like, oh, we've got a change project. I need the super connectors. Now I don't need them anymore. Okay. The thing about working with super connectors is you have to stay connected for the long haul. Should we stop there again for another two minute conversation, right? Who are your super connectors? Are you a super connector? And what can you do about super connectors? So have a super connector conversation. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to show you some more interesting things about this. <laughs> What's interesting? Well, one thing that's interesting to me is that the three percent rule doesn't just seem to apply in organisations and systems. Okay, it also applies in social media. So, you know, if we look globally um, at the people that are tweeting, what we can see is that typically eighty-five percent of the content that gets retweeted comes from just 3% of people, 3.3% of people um, who tweet. So again, a small number of people that are driving the conversations, that are driving um, the content. And I want to show you a little case study of this now, um, which is from, from my new boss. Okay, So the new National Improvement Director for NHS Improvement in NHS England is called Hugh McCarthy. Um, and he's brand new, came from Northern Ireland, so doesn't really know anybody in the English system. And... You know, he wants to build relationships with, with people across the country who, um, who work, um, you know, in local systems uh, leading improvement. So, um, so, so I'm going to show you how Hugh, who's got no relationship with the system at all, is able to work through um, super connectors in this way. So, um, the people in my team are, like, probably um, some of the most skilled people in social media anywhere globally in, in, in the healthcare world, probably. So, um, so we said, Hugh, um, we'll set you up some tweet chats. Okay? So we set him up his first one, which is here, on the 20th of May. And, um, and you know, the idea was for Hugh to be able to have a, com a, a relational conversation. Okay? He's one of the top leaders in NHS improvement. But what, what, the, the, um, you know, what this was saying is, what does the National Improvement Director need to know about the improvement work that's currently ongoing across England? And, um, and again, he's, you know, these are his questions so that he wanted to cover. So a tweet chat uh, is, is an hour. And you advertise it, and anybody that wants to can come and be part of the, the tweet chat. And you're having a conversation with each other on Twitter, and how you stay connected to each other is you're all using the same hashtag, which uh, is the hashtag here, uh, which is hashtag... Um, improve for patients, okay? So what, all you basically do is you just, you, when it's happening, so like 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock on the 20th of May, you go, on to, or you go on to Twitter and you look up this hashtag, um, uh, hashtag improve for patients, and then you have a, you have a, everyone's having a conversation with everyone else, okay? Um, so, so the first thing is, he knows no one, right? Um, I mean, he's fantastic, but he doesn't know anyone, okay, because he's new. Um, and we want to connect him with hundreds of frontline improvement leaders in the NHS. So how do we do it? Okay. We work through the super connectors. So what we did is um, we did our social analytics and we found the, the 31 most influential people in uh, healthcare improvement in the NHS. Okay. And the, so the, the, the tweet chat was on the Monday night. The Friday lunchtime before, so only like one working day before, uh, we direct messaged all these 31 people that are really influential on, on Twitter and said, Hugh's having this tweet chat on Monday night, will you come and be part of it and will you get, all your, will you get other people on board? And the only way we advertised this tweet chat was through these 31 people who the analytics told us were the, were the um, social media super connectors, okay? And they created an audience of 1.23 million people. Okay, and so in that hour, 
There was a conversation going on on Twitter for that hour, and 777 people came and were in that conversation together for an hour, okay, who were all mobilised by the 31 people, uh, one working day beforehand. In that one hour, nearly 2,000 tweets were posted, like original tweets, not like retweeting somebody else. And, yeah, 1.24 million people were reached. And not only that, they came up with the most brilliant ideas, these 777 people. And, um, and they came up with 49 great ideas. So what it meant for Hugh, he's brand new in his job, and he's connecting you know, with all these people that are just giving him really great ideas. So, um, you know, I think there's so much we can do. And again, what we do, like, this is a bit... <clears throat> okay, this is... Um, but, you know, a lot of the stuff we do, my team does, is, is we're doing um, very detailed social analytics, social influence analytics, because we want to understand all the time who are the, um, the super connectors. And, um, and what you've got in the middle of, um, of each of these is, um, is, is a super connector, okay? And all the green lines show that um, loads and loads of connections are happening uh, between people. So, um, and again, what we do is we go into the detailed analytics from that and, 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 and you know, continue to build our understanding of who are the people we need to work through. So in the old days of improvement, you know, the national director would, like, send out, a, you know, an introductory email, this is what I'm doing, and it would, like, cascade down through the system through many layers. Now, we just set this up, work for the influencers, and we get 771 passionate people in an hour. And, you know, it makes me laugh sometimes, or it makes me cry. You know, when I think about the NHS, um, you know... You know, we say to our clinical colleagues, well, yes, you know, we trust you to run a £15 uh, million pound clinical unit every day. And yes, we trust you in your clinical practice to save lives every single day or to, um, uh, you know, do whatever you, important things you do clinically. Um, but we don't trust you to use Facebook at work, you know. And it's, like, ridiculous. Because um, our data from my team, what it shows us is that um, typically our NHS employees have got ten times more connections than corporate social accounts. So our staff, you know, whether we want them, whether we want them to be or not, the reality is that they're the voice of our organisations. They've got audience and they've got credibility. And uh, just show you something else. And this comes from Rebecca Barrett, who's one of my Twitter friends. Um, and you know, nurses in at Nottingham University Hospital on their nursing and periphery board, they did a survey. And what they found was that nurses who were active on Twitter and what they call Twitter-enabled were twice as likely to recall successes and information from um, senior leaders than people that weren't on Twitter. So it isn't just, you know, get your messages across. Actually, you know, when we work in very um, social and relational ways, it, it moves things forward. Okay? Who's on Twitter? Well, great. Um, yeah, have a conversation about... Um, uh, about Twitter and super connectors. Okay, just going to give you two minutes. Two. Just want to show you um, one example of um, of a project where we're working in new ways that are highly relational. Okay, and um, who's this? Do you know who that is? Simon Stevens. Okay, so yeah. This is Simon Stevens in his, um, in his high-vis jacket, and, uh, and he's the chief exec of NHS England, NHS Improvement. And, you know, um, one thing that's great about Simon is he spends quite a lot of time going out on the road, um, you know, in situ with clinical staff. Um, he's fantastic at doing that. So he went out um, with a group of diff with paramedics on the road. He went out with paramedics, uh, paramedic crews in London, and he went out with paramedic crews in uh, the West Midlands. And what he found were these like incredible, enthusiastic, passionate, energised people who had no way of getting their ideas uh, for improvement and innovation into the system. Because, you know, I mean, I've um, been doing a lot of work with ambulance services now and, and I meet so many amazing people. But, you know, the kind of background that ambulance service come, come from is almost like militaristic, very, very top down, very command and control. And, um, and it's hard to innovate when you work at the front line of care. So, um, so Simon decided that he was going to set up a uh, frontline ambulance staff improvement project. And, um, uh, and it, it was set up, and it's now called Hashtag Project A for Ambulance Improvement. And, um, and this is what happened next, was um, 
um, he announced at the Ambulance Leadership Forum that he was going to set up this project to have frontline staff um, you know, uh, engaged in innovation and improvement. And um, I found out after he'd announced it, but it's all right. <laughs> and um, anyway, you know, the whole idea is how do we unleash the collective brilliance of people that work in ambulance services with a few critical friends? And how do we move from like the conformity zone where you have to do what you're told, you have to follow the protocol, um, you know, um, you have to conform to the system to actually unleashing the superpower of, um, of um, these colleagues. So my team got brought in to help. And um, our, this project was called Project A, um, A for Ambulance. Um, and, um, and what we did, we launched this project last June, and we got 180 frontline ambulance staff in a room to co-create what they wanted to do. And then two weeks later, we opened um, what's called a crowdsourcing platform, which um, I'll show you it there. Uh, uh, basically, what the crowdsourcing platform does is, um, is it enables people from all across the system to put their ideas on how we can improve things. When we set this crowdsourcing platform up, we had a hell of a fight because people from ambulance services or the senior leaders were saying it needs to be anonymous, the platform, and it needs to be closed. You know, only only um, certain people that are allowed to have, to have access to it, and um, and and you've got to let people uh, post content anonymously. And we said no, no way, we're doing that. Okay, it's got to be opened, and you've got to be responsible for your own comments, and. Um, and, they, and, and we said, you know, why, why should it be anonymous and closed? Because people will put bad things on it. And we're like, well, so what? And, you know, what was interesting, we got 31,000 interactions with the system, and four of them were negative. And, um, and what we also did, so we had this platform that was open, and we were doing loads of community management and getting people putting their ideas across. And we also held a series of tweet chats, okay, and, and to put that in as well. Um, and, um, and at the end of the six weeks that it was open, we had 608 fantastic ideas. And then we had a virtual decision-making uh, uh, group, and we prioritised 89 ideas. We tested two of them, we tested 12 of them, sorry, in what we call an innovation burst. And the innovation burst was we had two days where virtually we had teams from ambulance services all over the UK testing out new ways of doing things. And then we, we, we moved to ideas to implement last October. And, um, and again, we use tweet chats, and what we're able to do is to work out, you know, um, who are the inf influencers, who are the super connectors, and we make sure that those people are involved, because you get your super connectors engaged, leading things, and, and other people join in. And um, anyway, they came up with 608 ideas. What was interesting, the most um, common ideas were around staff well-being, um, organisational change in the sector, integration, um, training, and development. And where we are now is... Um, is we're working on five things. Okay, we've got a project across England, uh, so across the UK, around uh, around responding to people that fall. And every one of the thirteen ambulance services across the UK are all working on the same framework together now. Not on the basis of compliance, like somebody said, this is the new framework and you've all got to do it, but on the basis of commitment. Okay. Um, uh, we, um, we've got a project which is about um, responding to people in mental health crisis and emotional distress. This was one of the biggest issues that came up time and time again from, um, from ambulance crews, which is basically, you know, if somebody has got a suspected stroke or a heart attack or they've broken their leg, um, we know what to do because we follow the protocol. But when people, you know, when we're called out to people who are in mental health crisis or emotional distress, we don't know what to do. You know, we, do, we, we just kind of scoop them up and take them somewhere and we'd, rather, we'd like to do more. And then um, also there's an action on staff well-being. Do you know that um, it kind of shocks me, really? Um, I didn't know the ambulance sector that well until I got involved in, in Project A. There's no formal systems in most ambulance services for, um, for emotional decompression or, um, or emotional support. That there is when there's major incidents, but, you know, ambulance crews and call centre staff, every single day, they're, they're in really, really distressing situations. Okay? And the PTSD levels... And the um, absence, they're up here. And yet there's no formal system um, to, um, to emotionally decompress day to day. And, um, and that's some of the work that, you know, that we're, um, we're picking up on now. We've got a directory of good ideas because we had so many great ideas and we couldn't do them all. And we're also virtually collaborating. Let's talk a bit more about that. You know, when, when, you, um, when you work with ambulance staff, there's this process called abstraction. And um, I didn't even know what it was before, but anyway, what it basically means is 
um, you can't take ambulance staff away from clinical duties to do improvement work or training very easily because we're so short of ambulance crews and ambulance staff, they need to stay on the job. So we couldn't, like, you know, create loads. We, we couldn't have meetings like today. We can have the odd one, but not, not many, because we can't abstract the staff. So we set the whole thing up virtually. And none of them had ever worked in that way before. And now, you know, we work with these systems, and we can get 1,000 people taking part together in a, in a virtual conversation. And most of them do this in their own time. Um, so I'm just going to stop there for a moment, and we're good. So, you know, what we're talking about here is... Um, how can we do things differently? How can we leverage change in complex situations? So one thing I'd say that's really important is um, you have to understand that the issues that we're trying to address, they're at different levels. And the intervention, what we do, how we, how we um, uh, address the change depends on the, 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 the level of the issue. And we can be dealing with things or issues that are, that are, that are simple, you know? And it's a bit like baking a cake. So we, um, there's something like, if we follow the recipe, we follow the protocol, okay, we'll get the same results every time. That's, that's simple. It's protocolized. It's straightforward. We follow things. Then we got complicated, okay? And complicated means that, you know, there's, there's some specifics of this context that make it more tricky, and we need some, um, we need some formula. If X, if X is the case, then do Y. But um, we know that you know, we've, we, we've got a lot of experience as clinicians and we know what to do. And so we build that up over time and we can repeat it and we can get a success. So a complicated would be something like you know, sending a rocket to the moon. It's very complicated. But actually, we've got a lot of experience and expertise that we can build on and we can follow formulas. Okay. Then the final kind of um, uh, issue to address is raising a child, okay, here. You know, so when you're raising, it's, that's complex. You know, you can't, like, read a book and raise a child. You can't follow a protocol and, you know, um, uh, raise a child. There's no right recipes or protocols. And, and so many outside factors influence what happens, okay? And experience helps and wisdom helps, but we can't always guarantee success. What we see again and again in our health and care sector is that we are dealing with issues that are complex and we address them as if they're complicated, okay? And, uh, and it won't work. So, I think if we are going to be dealing with complex issues and uh, we want to have the right kind of conversation and deal with them in the right way, I think there's two factors that really help us um, to understand this. The first is about working interdependently. We used that word earlier on. I just want to talk a little bit more about that. And secondly, particularly working in big, complex areas with, with lots of different participants, how do we build our shared purpose? So let's talk about the difference between being independent and interdependent. Okay? How many of you have been trained in quality improvement methods? Okay? Lots of us. Okay? Um, when I went to improvement school in the NHS a long time ago, I got taught how to um, set up independent improvement initiatives. And what that means is, you know, give me a topic to focus on. So I, I, these are some primary care. But, you know, if, um, this is a classic independent initiative. What I want to do is I want to improve the um, stop smoking rates amongst people living with asthma and pulmonary disease, okay, um, in my practice. So I can draw a boundary around it, okay, uh, so, you know, these are the people I'm going to focus on, and these are the, um, the interventions that I'm going to make. And there's a whole series of improvement tools that I can use. So, who uses this one, the model for improvement, PDSA? Who's learnt that one? Yeah, quite a lot of us. Who's learnt this one, statistical process control, SPC? Yes, yeah, some of us have learnt that. Um, fishbone diagram, Ishikawa, yeah? So, so in a sense, there's, a, there's specific tools that we can use. So, so very often, when you get trained in quality improvement in the health and care system, you get trained to run independent projects. And independent projects are, are fine and they're completely appropriate and they're very powerful when we're working with projects that are simple or complicated at the least. Okay? But when you are working with complex projects, we have to work interdependently. Okay? And what we mean by interdependent, we mean that, um, of course... You know, I've got, um, you know, I'm, um, I'm the leader of my hospice and I've got the goals and outcomes that I've got to achieve for my hospice. And 
So that's independent. And at the same time, I'm working in a complex system with other partners, and I am dependent on those other partners to get my goals as well. So interdependent means I am dependent on other people and other partners to achieve my goals. So you know, this is another primary care one. This is an interdependent initiative. Improving the response to somebody presenting in primary care with a mental health crisis. Okay, I can't draw a boundary around that and follow a and, and just follow a protocol. You know, I need to work with so many um, other partners. And the thing about an interdependent um, initiative, it's social and collaborative. It's built on shared purpose. You can't just use a few um, powerful tools. You have to use multiple methods. And I'd say we are in a world where we have to work increasingly in interdependent ways. And it, what it means, we have to think differently and we have to do things differently. And often when we're working independently, we have an, we have an inward mindset. So, so again, I'm, um, I'm just going to kind of have a go at this, um, and you know this better than me. But again, if I'm, in a, you know, if I'm a, a senior clinical leader in a hospice, okay, and I have got an inward mindset, then where do I start from? I start from the, uh, my organisation or, 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 or my group and, um, uh, you know, the people and the families that, that we serve. So, and we think about our interests as a, as a, um, as a, a hospice or um, no, as an organisation or, or a group of, group of people with a clear mission. And very often we think in a silo. So it's like when I'm going into interactions with other people, how can I get the best for my organisation and my and families and the people that I serve? And it means very often that we've got, we've got tunnel vision. And the way that we behave when we're interacting with others, you know, we'll be friendly and co cooperative. But at the end of the day, it's my organisation that counts. You know, um, I've got to get the results we need. So actually, my behaviours are ones that protect and advance me and, uh, and my group. And increasingly, the kind of problems and issues that we're dealing with are interdependent. So we have to start with an outward mindset. So, you know, we have to start with understanding the kind of the, the bigger system and the bigger purpose, okay? And our shared purpose with other, um, with other partners. And we've got to focus on, on um, collaboration with others because actually we can't achieve our goals on our own. And instead of having this tunnel, tunnel vision, we need to kind of be aware of the bigger system. And when we talk about behaviours, um, we need behaviours that advance the collective result. And in a sense, we probably need to end up working with both. You know, because of course we're in a, in a mindset. You know, I'm responsible for what happens in my organisation and, and getting a good future for my organisation, but it isn't enough. I need to think in outward ways as well. And, um, and um, I just put this quote here. You know, like, often when we're in a bigger system and we're collaborating with others and we're trying to make change happen, um, you know, we can end up in a situation of winners and losers. Ha ha, you know, it's great, the hospice won and the community services didn't, you know, because we got the best outcome from here and they didn't. And I'm just saying this to like for dramatic effect, okay, and just cumulate, okay. Um, and, you know, very often people can win very powerfully. Um, uh, and, and, you know, because we've won, um, then, you know, we can create sustainable change. But where there's powerful losers, we're never going to win. You know, the thing about when you're working interdependently, there can't be winners and losers, okay? There can only be, there can only be winners. And, and what we, and, you know, I work with loads of, in, you know, uh, integrated care systems and sustainability and transformation partnerships in the NHS. And the big thing we're trying to get across is we've got to work with an outward mindset and we can't have winners and losers. We can, we can only have winners and we've got to think about the bigger system. And, you know, one of the things that we say is systems leadership can only move forward at the pace of, at the speed of trust. Because if leaders don't trust each other, um, if leaders are, like, are starting from a place of an inward mindset and trying to make sure that my organisation comes out of this the best um, and, and I'm not thinking about the bigger system, it's never going to work. And when I look across England and I look at the, ICE, the integrated care systems that are really motoring and moving forward, what you see is you get a group of leaders, senior organisational leaders that are collaborating with, collaborating with each other very effectively. Okay? Last thing I want to talk about okay, is shared purpose and why shared purpose is even more important in our, our increasingly complex world with, with, with many partners and many stakeholders. And whatever else we do, we need to be building shared purpose. And this comes from Seth Carguillo. And I think it's a very helpful way of thinking about shared purpose. And he said, shared purpose goes way deeper than vision and mission. 
You know, your shared purpose goes right into your guts and taps into some part of your primal self. And he says, I believe that if you can bring people with similar primal purposes together, you know, feel the same things in their hearts and get them all marching in the same direction, amazing things can be achieved. And I think that's often that's our number one duty, okay, as change agents is to make that happen. And, um, you know, this is, um, every day I, I, I wear this little bracelet because I'm an improvement leader. And this is just to kind of remind me that improvement, you know, whatever we're trying to do, the things that we're trying to make better, always has to be anchored in purpose. And we have to start from a place of purpose. Um, um, uh, this is Prana Isar, and um, she's our new chief people officer in the NHS. She's fantastic. Okay? And, um, and, you know, again, talking about um, NHS and workforce and, and igniting and energising. You know, she, um, Prana says... We've got to reconnect our health and care actions back to the shared purpose at the founding of the NHS, back to principles of social justice. So when we're doing, you know, change activities, okay, it's not just about all, what's our aim here. You know, our aim is to imp improve safety or um, improve quality. You know, we've got to take it back to a much more primal place. That's what she's saying. And, you know, when you think about social, social justice, the equal worth of all citizens, the equal right to meet their basic needs, you know, to spread opportunity and chances as widely as possible, to reduce um, inequality, okay? And that's what you do as well. You know, when I think about the hospice movement and, um, and you know, where that started and the kind of the really profound social justice that underpins, you know, what you do. And I think other people in the system don't understand that uh, enough. And I think, you know, it's, uh, it's such an important place. And so, you know, when we're talking about, you know, when we make change happen, where are we starting from, you know? Are we starting from, you know, I have some key performance indicators for you for the next 12 months, or are we starting from I have a dream? And where we're trying to make change happen, we have to start, you know, at the place, what, what's our dream, okay? Um, you know, what's the dream that we share? Because what we know is that actually the evidence tells us really clearly, if we start from a place of I have a dream, it's a heck of a lot easier to do KPIs because people understand why, we're doing the KPIs. So, one of the things I want to suggest to you, um, as a kind of starting point, you know, for, for change and improvement and transformation that you're engaged in, is to start from a place of our shared purpose. And we need to think about all three things. So, first of all, we need to think about who are the hour, okay? And, you know, we have, like, who are our people, okay? Who needs to share our purpose? Who are the people that are going to be impacted by the change? Who needs to be part of the change? Then the second question is, thinking about those people, what unites us? You know, what, you know, what is the thing that we share, that, that we move forward? And then we need to think about purpose. Why are we taking action? How does it connect with things that, um, that, that really matter to us? And we need to think about all three. So... So we have the, our shared purpose. So when we're talking about the shared bit, what unites us, you know? Let's look for the commonalities and understand the difference. And, you know, what I would suggest is that when we're doing the shared bit, take time to get people talking about their own stories, okay? Um, and, and I do that on project teams all the time now. We just go around and we get everybody um, to tell a story, you know? So, um, so I've been doing some work recently on... Um, on um, aging well, you know, around, around frailty, and, um, and we start the, the session by everybody going round and telling us, tell a story about why, this, why, why aging well is important to you, why is it important to me, um, because what happens is when we tell stories, people find the things, the values in the stories that they can connect with, um, and, and we need to think about differences as well, and then we need to think about how we create a, um, a statement of purpose, you know, how can this sense of us, the things that unite us, be translated into a statement of purpose that we can all unite around. Okay, watch your language and perspective. You know, like doing this very often with groups of clinicians, um, you know, we're putting all sorts of like clinical terminology in. And a, we, and a we that is like a clinical we, not a we are the people we. Okay, and the next thing is we need to create a purpose and not an aim. Um, and it's got to pass the purpose test. So, so very often, when we get people doing purpose, they write things in the purpose. Um, the purpose is um, to offer a great service to every person or um, to, um, to be compassionate or um, to make best use of money. That's not a purpose, okay? Uh, that's an aim. An aim is setting a determined course to achieve a set goal, 
Okay? Purpose is about making explicit the reason behind something. Purpose is a, you know, a much um, deeper place. And you know, what I'd suggest to you, um, you know when you're doing work with a, with a group, copy this template and get people to do it, like our shared purpose. Okay? So when we get people to do this, we say, does it fit the test? And this is the test that we use. Okay? Well, I'm looking at that purpose, um, you know, I'm in, the, in the final column up there. Purpose is the deepest dimension within us, our central core, core or essence, where we have a profound sense of who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. Purpose is the quality we choose to shape our lives around. Purpose is a source of energy and direction. Just going to show you one example of a shared purpose. Okay. Does anybody know about end PJ paralysis? Yeah, lots of us do. Yeah. So it's this basically it's this um, amazing frontline initiative to to mobilise um, you know people who would um, otherwise be left in a hospital bed and um, uh, uh, and get them the best possible outcomes. And again, um, this there was um, a there was a ninety day um, challenge. Uh, and it saved 710,000 um, hospital days. So it's a brilliant thing. Let me just show you their shared purpose. Okay. So who's the hour? The hour is lots of people, patients, nurses, families, physios, senior leaders, doc you know, all the people that can make a part. Okay. What unites us? What unites us is our anger at outrage and outrage at older patients deteriorating when we can do something about it. Okay. So it's, it's a place of emotion. You know? And that's what unites us, because this, this thing is happening to people that are languishing in hospital beds, wearing night clothes, that shouldn't be happening. Okay? And what's our purpose? Okay? Our purpose is to make sure that every person in a hospital bed gets mobilised when they're ready, both clinically and personally, and that every person gets choice and a chance for the future life they want. So our purpose you know, is to keep people, um, is, is to give people life chances. And very often, we'd write, we'd write that like an aim. You know, our aim is to get everybody mobilised as soon as they can, to reduce length of stay. And no, that's not a purpose. You know, our purpose is much more profound. And what we know, and you know this better than me, and this is my final slide, <coughs> okay? If we want people to take action and get engaged in change, the most effective way of doing that is connecting with emotions through values. And that's why we've got we to be really explicit about shared purpose for change, okay? We have to go to that place. When I went to improvement school a long time ago in the NHS, I got told that if I wanted to influence a clinical doctor uh, to get them involved in change, I had to show them a graph. Because doctors are only influenced to change by data. It's not true. Even medical doctors are far more likely to engage in change because, you know, we, um, because we make this connection. And stories are one of the best ways of doing this. And you, you know, I mean, you in the hospice movement know this more than anybody. So take what you bring, your sense of social justice, your, you know, ability, an amazing thing around shared purpose, and, um, and you know, uh, infect the rest of us with it. Because I think you are in such a great starting point um, uh, that so much the rest of us can learn from in terms of large-scale change. And I've got one second, so I'm going to finish there. Thank you.